Hi, everyone. It's Henry DeVries, CEO of Indie Books International. Welcome to this edition of the Marketing with a Book and Speech podcast. So glad to have you here. And we have a special guest for you today, General Jeff Foley. Before we do that, we always like to introduce our Indie Books authors who are on the call. And we're going to do the author roll call. And we'll start with uh, David Goldman and then Mark and Bill. Thanks, Henry. Just the title? Uh, your name and the title of your book. Yeah. Hi, my name is David Goldman, and I wrote a book called The Road to Happiness. Thank you. Uh, Mark and Bill. Thank you, Henry. Uh, my latest book, uh, co-authored with Henry and Penny Reed, is Persuade with a Case Acceptance Story. Thanks, Mark. Uh, Bill and then John. Uh, Bill, if you could unmute yourself, please. Yep. Hi, I'm still Bill Leiter. Um, <laughs> my, my book to be released in March is Mastering Your Balance. Thanks, Bill. And uh, John Lockhorst. Hi, I'm John Lockhorst. I'm the author of Mission Critical Leadership, which is to be released in April. Thanks. Uh, Louisa and then Brad. Louisa, we see you, but we don't hear you. For some reason, you're not coming through. We're gonna to go to Brad and then Diane, please. Hi, thanks. Uh, name is Brad Pierce, and I'm the author of a book called Sustainability Mind Shift, which I hope to have out sometime mid-year. Hey, Brad, you're in Massachusetts, right? That's right. Yeah, I had to tell you out here in California, uh, weather's been a little hard. We got walloped with a 12 inches of sunshine today. Ooh, okay. Well, I'll take that any day. <laughs> okay. Uh, fellow <laughs> Californian, uh, Diane, and then we'll go to Steve in the great state of Texas. Oh, and you're on mute, Diane. So uh, please unmute yourself when, you, when we uh, call you on the roll call. Thanks, Diane. Hi, I'm Diane Ploys. The book I'm working on is Questions to Ask Before You Buy a Franchise. Thank you. Uh, from the great state of Texas, Steve Brody. Hi, I'm Steve Brody. We, we didn't get 12 inches, Henry. We got 12 degrees, which is a little <laughs> unusual, for weird for Houston. Uh, my book is called What Happens After the Sale. Yeah. I heard it was so cold in Houston that uh, a lawyer had his hands in his own pockets. <laughs> could be. I'm could moving be, on. Could be. Could be. Um, Elena, welcome to the call. Do you want to? Uh, well, we'll we'll go on and let's see. Did uh, uh, Christopher Hodges? And if you could unmute yourself, Chris. Sorry, I've been having a heck. But I'm connecting. My name's Chris Hodges. I'm the Did you hear me? Well, it was a little garbled. Uh, I think I think you got connections problems there. Okay. Well, with that, uh, that was our author roll call. Uh, oh, thanks, this everybody. This is Elena. Oh, Elena. I, I'm uh, unmuted. Elena Bixen, I attended one of Henry's wonderful retreats, and my book is in progress. The working title is Looking for Enlightenment in All the Wrong Places. <laughs> I'd, I'd buy that book. Okay. <laughs> Thanks for visiting. Glad you're here. Okay. Well, we're going to get on to it. First off, uh, I always like to get a nugget of wisdom for everybody from the chairman of Indie Books International, Mark LeBlanc. So Mark, if you had something to share to start us off, that'd be great. Thank you so much, Henry. And thank you everyone for joining us uh, uh, today. I just wanna shine a, a little pin light on uh, the power of the mentor-mentee relationship. A uh, mentor of mine passed away today. His name uh, is uh, Tom Winninger. 
and I first met Tom when I was 22 years old, 38 years ago. He wrote the foreword to my first book, Growing Your Business, uh, but that was small in comparison to the impact and influence he has had on me over the course of time. Um, I know that we all have people in our lives who have uh, helped steer us at times. My question to you is, do we really take the time to thank them and acknowledge them for the good uh, service and contribution to our careers? Um, I'm not sure I did that with Tom, um, at least uh, to the degree that I, I now wished I had. Um, so I've already started a list of those people who have been uh, incredibly generous with their time and their talents and their treasures with me over the course of 38 years. So my message to you today is thank one of your mentors this week. Thank you, Henry. Thank you, Mark. And of course, you. Of course, you too. Sorry, I was. I was thanking Henry because he's my coach. <laughs> oh, well, thanks. You're. You're. As they say at Chick Fil A, my pleasure, Brad. Um, yeah, it's. It's been a tough year for a lot of things. Uh, we've seen. Uh, we've said goodbye, or we didn't even get to say goodbye to a lot of good people. And as the scripture says, time and unforeseen occurrence befall us all. So a great reminder, Mark, um, you know, don't put off saying thank you. Um, and there's also people I know uh, that uh, years ago, I started not putting off telling them and I love them. And they, they always like, are you okay? Is something wrong? And I said, well, I, I'm fine. I just wanted you to know that I love you. Um, so uh, I think that's a great idea too, Mark. We might do a, a whole episode on mentoring. The, how to be a good mentor and how to be a good mentee. I think that that's a great idea. Well, let's move to our special guest, General uh, Jeff Foley, Brigadier General U.S. Army, retired. Um, Jeff hails from Cincinnati. I know this because I got treated to a tour of Cincinnati with Jeff. Uh, great seats at a Reds game, uh, great ice cream, great ribs. Uh, we bumped into Pete Rose and Joe Morgan and uh, visited with them for a while. Um, a, a nice way to tour the city. Jeff less, left Cincinnati to go to West Point. And after graduating from West Point, served 32 years uh, in the U.S. Army. Thank you for your service. The, uh, he's the founder of Laurel Mountain Solutions. That's his consulting. He works with business leaders who want to achieve greater results. So He's a leadership coach. He uh, helps them develop lasting change, positive change. That's what he really enjoyed in the army was uh, the leadership training and helping train others to be leaders. And he has segued into a career where he gets to do that. So that's his encore career. Um, his latest book is Brave Business Leadership, another person with multiple books. So when you ask Jeff, when you tell Jeff you wanna read his book, he can say, oh, which one? So brave leadership, uh, brave business leadership. I'm sorry, I helped name that book. I should get it right. Brave business leadership is uh, his latest. And uh, I recommend it highly. We published it here at Indie Books. Uh, the book really captures the best practices from the US Army. When I was helping Jeff as a developmental editor, so interesting uh, to see that the Army has this culture and core value of developing leaders. And it goes back to, I believe, 1775. So uh, it's a long, rich tradition. And there's a lot of lessons to be learned in other leadership fields. And that's what he shares. Uh, on a personal note, he's a recovering college baseball center fielder uh, for West Point. These are the Knights. And uh, he's a lifetime Cincinnati Reds baseball fan, which sometimes builds character. Please welcome General Jeff Foley. Well, thank you, Henry and Mark. It's always good to, to be in your company. Uh, I learn every time I hang out with you guys uh, and so many others in your stable of authors and consultants and coaches. So it's a great joy for me. 
Uh, this is my book, Brave Business Leadership, Grow Competent, Confident Leaders and Get Great Results. Uh, and it really was derived from my military career and then sometime after that. So let me take you back to 1984 when I was a young captain assigned to be a company commander in a place called Camp Red Cloud in Weejambu, Korea. I was six years out of the academy. I was assigned as the commanding officer of a company. And a commanding officer is like a president or CEO of a company. I had 210 soldiers. We were at a place called Camp Red Cloud. We were 35 miles from the demilitarized zone separating North and South Korea. My boss was two hours away. We had a wartime mission and the company that I was going to lead did not have a great reputation for accomplishing their mission. And to top it off, company command as a captain in the army is a critical assignment. And if you are successful in that assignment, it opens doors for the next phase and enables you to continue your career in the army. If you fail or even don't do a great job, but a mildly successful job, your likelihood of getting promoted is not good. So the pressure really was on me and my ability, was I gonna be successful? So despite all the training and education and experience I had going in, and despite the confidence that my leaders had in me being able to go into that job and being successful, I still had some doubts. I still wondered if I was gonna be able to conquer the task and be accepted as the commander and achieve the missions in our wartime environment that we needed to achieve. Well, uh, at the end of 14 months, I will tell you that we did accomplish every mission thrown our way. And we did it for a variety of reasons. Make no mystery that uh, it was not because of me. It was, I learned more than anything else, the value of a team. It's same lessons I learned growing up in sports and everywhere else. The value of the team, the value of those guys and gals who were committed to accomplishing the task and committed to learning. But it also was the catalyst for the brave methodology that I'm capturing in my book. I learned that I had to make every decision based on those deep beliefs, those core values that I had embedded into my heart and soul. I had to make big time decisions from the day I took command to the day I left. Decisions that affected the lives of soldiers, career soldiers. I had to learn what tough love was all about. I learned that the development of leaders is perpetual. We were promoting guys and gals into higher positions and they had to learn new competencies. Everything that got them to where they got promoted wouldn't necessarily uh, be all the credentials and all the, uh, the competencies they needed to be successful at that next level. I learned how to be an effective coach, a more effective coach than I ever was before. And I learned perhaps more than anything else how important building trusted relationships with those guys and gals who worked for me and the leadership in the organizations that I had to work for that we were in support of. And they were colonels and generals from not only the United States Army, but also the Korean Army. Those were the fundamentals, the timeless lessons that I learned at Camp Red Cloud Korea and reinforced throughout my military career that ultimately led me to the brave methodology that I capture in my latest book. And what I learned in addition to just how effective and how important people are, what I also learned was the army was the right place for me. I was about ready to complete my commitment to the army from the academy. I didn't know if I wanted to continue or not, but what I really learned was I fell in love with this organization and I fell in love with the the power and the authority and the ability to develop people and to learn that so many people had my interest in my development uh, on their radar screen and helped me. It was a marvelous experience for me. So I retired in 2010 and it was about six years later, I think that I met 
this gentleman named Henry DeVries, who you all have met. And I went out to San Diego and I met with Henry and I later met with Mark and I got a better picture of what indie publishing is all about. And Henry said, do you think you've got another book in you? I said, I don't know if I do. I meet with you because I, I had to figure this out, do I? And after about 15 minutes, Henry said, you got plenty to write a book on. You got multiple books in you. And all I wanted to do was write one more. I don't think I had, writing books is hard. Talking about writing two books, I got to tell you, when I go back to my high school reunions uh, in Cincinnati, I, all my buddies say, Foley, what's this deal about you writing books? We don't even remember you reading many books in high school. And they're right, but I've learned how to write. And boy, I had a lot of help in writing this one. So I'm not convinced I was Mark and Henry's ideal client. When I first met with Henry, it was three years almost before I actually published my book. I think it was about two and a half years really was the timeline on when I first started and signed the contract. And finally, we was able to produce the book. And I think Mark and Henry generally are looking for perhaps a quicker turn for most of their clients. But I am so grateful to both for having the patience and the willingness to work with me because the final version of this book learned nothing like the initial journey going into it. I wanted to share a little bit about uh, how to get people to read your book. So I heard most of you all have a work in progress. Uh, and like I said, it took me two and a half years to do that. So step one, and Mark and Henry will, I know writing the book is a journey and it was a painful process for me, an enjoyable but painful process. But Mark and Henry both will both tell you, they always told me, they always tell you, they tell everybody, writing the book is step one. That is the beginning, really, of the journey. The second part is how do you distribute the book? How do you get into the hands of those potential people who could benefit from reading and absorbing the content from the book. And you do that clearly by speaking. This is not rocket science. I've learned this from uh, the indie folks leadership here and many others. But really, you, I, I planned on using this book as sort of a, a pretty robust business card. The fact that I had it, it's got credibility, it's got endorsements and testimonials from my work. But ultimately, it was a keynote presentation uh, where it would be the ideal time for me to give every member of the audience a book. And that's always been a great idea for everybody as you're going to go out and speak. Write the contract, include copies of the book everywhere you go. I had two big time uh, speaking engagements during the last year that were canceled. Just like most others, the speaking world changed dramatically when COVID hit. And there were probably 200 copies of the book going to both of those and probably two more speaking engagements that never happened. So I have not sold a lot of books and I have not distributed a lot of books, at least for pay. What I did in my COVID world is I ended up giving a lot of books away. I felt compelled to help people wherever they were, uh, especially those in the nonprofit world and other organizations where they were suffering for a variety of different reasons. I just wanted to give and I gave my book away. So that's how I got the book into the hands of many. But how do you get people to read it? How do you really get people to be attracted to it and want to read it and then apply whatever it is that they learn? That's ultimately what we're trying to do. We're trying to change people one person at a time perhaps and giving them ideas and ways that they can apply the lessons that we have learned and what we wrote down. How do we get them to read it? So one of the ways to do it that I've learned is the credibility factor. Uh, being a general in the army certainly helped, but I will tell you, there's a lot of people out there who are skeptical of military leaders. You know, they don't go to war, so they, that doesn't apply. They don't carry guns and weapons and all of that. That doesn't apply. And really, they talk about this command and control environment that the Army operates in that is such a strict command and control. Everybody simply does. There's this perception that everybody does whatever and whoever outranks them tells them to do. And I will tell you, in times of uh, lives being on the line, 
time is short and of the essence, that's true. That's where the discipline of the military comes into play. But for the vast majority of time, nothing could be further from the truth. In the army, we educate soldiers to think and we train soldiers to act. And it is for us to be adaptable and flexible on any battlefield or in any environment, we have to delegate authority and responsibility to the very lowest level possible. And that's what we do. And I think that's what most organizations want to do. The Army's been at this since Henry said 1775. We as an army are older than the United States of America. We've been at this leadership development stuff for a while. And so what I have learned in my book that I think is worth people reading and understanding how to develop your role as a leader, how to develop your competencies and your confidence in your ability to lead. I just think that's something that most leaders want to do. And I was very ex excited. And one of the, the delays in my, in my book was getting a self-assessment in the book so that people could buy the book, they could take the assessment, they could go to the chapter and help them get better at each one of the five elements of the brave leadership methodology. And I say there's five, each letter of the word brave means something. It's not just about courage and bravery. Uh, it really is be a leader of character and each letter means something if you read through the methodology. But how do you get it into the hands of people and cause them to read? Well, you do a self-assessment, they can do the self-assessment. I included that in my book and I think that's a very valuable piece of what I do. And also it now has become, not only in keynote presentations, talking about the book and the elements of the book, but it now has become a foundation for my coaching practice. I'm a leadership coach and that is my primary role in life, taking the valuable lessons learned about leading and developing others, things that I really was passionate about in the army and sharing them with us. And I do that through one-on-one -on -one coaching with individual senior leaders and then team coaching. And they are able to use this book as a foundation for that coaching experience. And what it means is I teach the book. We teach it a chapter at a time, whatever the needs are, whatever the environment calls for. That's how I think you can take whatever book you got, use it in keynotes and talk about it, and then use it in any coaching or consulting world that you might have. It also helps uh, in the credibility side because I've been able to develop some wonderful partnerships with world-class leadership developers. Uh, Marshall Goldsmith is the number one executive coach in America, has been for many years. Marshall volunteered to coach Army generals when I got promoted to general. Isn't that a cool thing? And I have since adopted Marshall's coaching methodology. I've been a partner with Ken Blanchard and his company for eight years now. Marvelous stuff. And the most prominent developer of teams is a guy named Pat Lend Patrick Lencioni. I'm a partner with the table group, Patrick's Work. So incorporating world-class curriculum and world-class processes and, and elements in, in to my brave methodology also makes mine stand out and makes it more credible than just a Jeff Foley and an Army experience. That's my message for you today. Uh, I hope it has been useful, and I certainly will, will welcome any comments or questions uh, and attempt to address those the best I can. But that's my message. Thanks for allowing me to share uh, that message of, with you all today. The jazz hands is that's our applause on Zoom. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, that was great. I've got to quit. I have follow up questions. And anybody else, uh, uh, go to the chat. If you have a question for Jeff, put it in the chat. Um, and uh, I'll work it in or Suzanne will uh, get my attention about it. Um, so let's see, you've been on your own now for eight years, is that right? Yes. Um, what, was the, what was the trigger event? So you're a Brigadier General, I imagine you could have stayed in, uh, you, you decided to go out, you decided to coach, what, what was the event? I had, you know, Mark talked about mentorship uh, earlier in the podcast here, 
I had a wonderful mentor named General Perry Smith. Uh, I have been a fan of Perry for many, many years. He lives in Augusta, Georgia, where I live. He has published several books and he invited me to co-author uh, this uh, my first book, Rules and Tools for Leaders, uh, with Perry Smith. And he invited me to update that and co-author it uh, and give that another run for its money. That's been a very popular book for many years. And I was honored to have that opportunity to do so. It was about the same time that you know, I met Ken Blanchard uh, and got involved in his company. I always wanted to be a leadership coaching consultant. But about 2012 is when both of those things happened that caused me to say time to leave my other health. I was working in the healthcare profession and as, as an executive in the, the healthcare world here in Augusta, Georgia. Time for me to leave and follow my journey. In the Army, we have a, a saying called move out and draw fire. I knew I wanted to be a leadership coach and consultant. Wasn't quite sure how it was gonna go. It's a pretty wide range of things that you could do, but I said, it's time for me to go do it. I'm gonna help write a book. I'm gonna get into this business and I'll figure it out as I go. Excellent. Oh, now the, the name of the army team, is it the Black Knights or the Knights? Well, it's Ooh. the Black Knights uh, yeah. is, uh, the football uh, is, is the program. The Golden Knights is the Army sport parachute team. So both of them apply. Black Knights is the name of the team that loses to Navy. Just let's get this oh. get straight, Jeff. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. None of that. We'll have none of that here. Okay. Well, uh, I just, that's Christopher Hodges. I just want to make a note. Yeah, yeah right, right. <laughs> uh, I, I, I still know some people, Chris. Yeah. <laughs> I'm on, so, a, I'm on a team in Pittsburgh, Henry, called the Lonely Knights, but that's a whole other story. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> class, class. Okay. Um, Jeff, your defining story. Why don't you give us your defining story? Well, I think uh, in terms of my coaching practice, uh, I had a client named William. That's not his real name but it is the name I'm using for the book. I met with William about uh, three years ago and I became his leadership coach and consultant for his, him and his organization. Uh, and as it turns out over the course of uh, 18 months, we went through each of the five components of my brave methodology. One is we had to develop a set of core values for his organization. That is how to be a leader of character. And it's all about understanding those deep beliefs that you have in your heart and soul and those expected behaviors of every member of the team. R is reveal and reinforce leader competencies. We had to put a leadership competency program in place and a performance appraisal and training program for all of his leadership, all of his leaders. We had. A is attack with the leader development program. Not only did we have to identify the leadership skills, abilities, uh, and competencies, we had to put a program in place for all of his leaders and down to his store managers to help develop leaders. And that program can, it continues today. V is value coaching excellence. I had to teach his leaders, not only Derek, but his leadership team, or William, I'm sorry, not only William, but his leadership team on how to be effective coaches, how to build one-on-one -on -one relationships with each of his individuals and be more effective. And then uh, E is embrace trusted relationships. And over time, William developed marvelously trusted relationships with his people. We increased trust not only with his internal members of his organization, but also with the CEO of the organization, William was the president, and also his customers and clients. And the point is over that period of 18 months, we used the brave methodology and his, the results that can be attributed to this is not easy to measure on a, on a spreadsheet, but the fact that he has built his team they have grown from a $40 million rev annual revenue to an $80 million revenue 
over the last four years. Not all of that happened in the first 18 months. But the point was based on the methodology that is captured in my book, and William's story is in there. That is really the reinforcement of how valuable I think this methodology can be. Thanks, Jeff. Um, I'm going to take a controversial question from the floor. And I'd like you to weigh in on it. I'd like Mark LeBlanc to weigh in on it next, and then I'll weigh in on it. So the seemingly innocent question from Louisa Drescher is, do you have a workbook to go with your book? <laughs> uh, that's a great question. And the answer is no, I don't. I've been asked about that. Uh, I'm not a curriculum developer. Uh, I do my, I, I, I work as a coach and we work on individual things. What I bring is not necessarily a book, but I bring brain power. You know, people don't write books on everything. I capture the essence of a book, but really it is the one-on-one -on -one coaching uh, and the experience and the empathy and sympathy that I have for just about every experience that I've had with my coaches or my clients. And we work through things together. I'm, I love prescription, I love process, and I love methodologies, but there's danger and a risk to that as well in terms of I don't want to get too, too process oriented. I want to have a dialogue. And the dialogue and the communication and the one-on-one -on -one that I have with people, I think is the most effective way to create change. Well, we live in a world of multiple right answers. So uh, let's have Mark weigh in right now. Well, Jeff, this is for you and anybody else out there. Um, rest assured that my next uh, book will indeed have the uh, implementation or the execution manual. I had every good intention um, of producing a workbook, spiral bound, they, you know, some bing, bang, ding, dong, uh, some kind of implement, implementation manual 20 years ago when my first book, Growing Your Business, came out. And life got in the way, my career got in the way, volume orders got in the way of me uh, completing that workbook. Today, after moving over 80,000 copies of my little blue book, Growing Your Business, there's a pretty good chance, and I believe this is conservative, that I've lost a half a million dollars to my bottom line in not having the implementation or the execution book. And it could be more. Um, I may start to cry. Um, I still see a therapist uh, over that mistake. Uh, but Henry has cautioned me that uh, uh, there, there's, there's never a wrong time to start not only your next book, but the companion workbook that goes with it. Thank you, Henry. Thanks, Mark. So, so when Mark and I traveled the country giving the Marketing with a Book and Speech Summit, this would always come up. And Mark would share the story for the variety of reasons that he didn't do the workbook. Okay. And as a joke, one month, as a joke, I, <laughs> I said, okay, every article I've done, every, every advice, every white paper, just throw it together in one document. And my team was appalled. <laughs> it, was, it was 250 pages, but they go, you know, it, it doesn't have the exact flow of the perfect workbook. And there's some workbook things in here, but there's other things. And I said, you don't get the point. It's a joke. And I had it spiral bound, just as Mark described. I produced four of them at Kinko's at $10 a piece. And then Mark gave his story and his spiel and, and it got to me and I said, oh, by the way, I have my workbook, my 250 page workbook, which I sell for $100. So I have them here. And four people came up and said, like, credit card, check, what would you like? <laughs> and I had $400 in my hands. And I believe we donated it to the foundation that Mark has started where uh, Mark grants a $3,000 
awards to young entrepreneurs under 30. By the way, if you know a young entrepreneur under 30, um, it's a pretty simple application process through Mark. Um, he can tell the story at a later date. Uh, but uh, it just proved the power of this, what, what you all might be leaving on the table. And talk about the comparison trap and the perfection trap. I see that gets in a lot of people's way. So in this world of multiple right answers, I would say another answer is take your last Microsoft Word document of your book. Have that set aside and then put in everything else you've got in the closet that you didn't put into the book and put it into the workbook and print it at FedEx Kinko's uh, double-sided with a spiral bound. Uh, the cover that we do for your book, you can just take that cover and add the workbook on it. Like, you know, the musical, the movie, the workbook and put it on there and call it version 1.0 like they do in the software industry. Uh, and you can improve that because it's, it's on your Word doc. You're not going to sell it through the internet. The people who are going to buy it are the people who bought your book or received your book, loved your training. Um, if you do a public seminar where you sell seats, you can have the workbooks there. There's somebody taught me this. They, he said, okay, these are not yours. These are just samples. Uh, but, uh, you know, look at page 107. Here's a list of all the different podcasts you could go on. And then later you say, um, here, look at page 210. This is a directory of places where you could speak. And then at the end you say, oh, the workbook's 100. If you want it, you can keep it. Other than that, we're, we're collecting the workbooks. And people say, wait a minute, uh, stop. I want this workbook. I've had many people who didn't work with me, but came up and talked to me about the workbook and how helpful it's been. And, um, and it's more for the uh, do-it-yourselfers and God bless them and you're helping them and it's spreading your good work. Just an option if you'd like to get some more revenue. Well, let's go back to Jeff. Um, so you're really a leadership development expert um, and You've told us a lot about leadership and what you want people to know. Um, I think on this topic of how to get people to read your book, that's great. Now you've done other things like a TEDx talk. Why don't you talk about that? I did, thank you. I, uh, I don't know, three or four years ago, uh, I had the opportunity to do a TEDx event here in Augusta, Georgia. I had 12 minutes to get my message across. Uh, it was a, I took it very seriously. I went and, and wrote the script, revised it a million times, had uh, rehearsals on stage with some very dear friends of mine who were in the actor and producer and director worlds. I, I even took uh, my presentation down to the fine arts high school uh, and where I know one of the teachers, and I said, listen, I wanna do it. I wanna do it in front of your 11th and 12th grade students. Uh, and I did. I went up on stage and I did the whole thing. And I found out how ultimately boring I was. These kids gave me some marvelous uh, advice uh, and asked me some profound questions about why I did it this way and why I didn't smile. And you, you're too much like a general. And, and I had to learn how to smile and have some fun. And I'm not a big joke teller, but I had to create some humor and, and all of that. So I did it. I was on stage. It's on my website, by the way. Uh, you can go do it. And it really, it's a different model. You know, I talk about how to leave a positive legacy in your life, regardless how old or young you are. And there's five elements. Guess what? There's five elements of that. And they spell caper. And it wasn't brave or anything else. Some of the elements are the same as my brave model. This was part of that journey. The TED Talk helped me bring out some stuff. But the TED Talk was a wonderful experience. I had a lot of help in, in getting that off the ground. Uh, it's on my, you can YouTube it. Uh, it's on my website as well. You can see what I did. But I often refer people to that because it's a foundation about leaving a positive leadership legacy in your life. And it's all the same stuff that I do. 
but it was great fun to do that. And I had the privilege of doing that here in Augusta. I wanted to advise everybody, and we'll have ex we've had Eleni uh, Palacos come on, and we'll have Des Thornton, and I think Des and Des and Eleni are both speaking at the IFF forum in March. If you can add TEDx speaker to the resume, it's a credibility builder. I don't think I wouldn't count on dollar one happening as a direct result of you gave a TED talk. But when you're in consideration for being a speaker and you can say, oh, you can see my TEDx talk and send them the link, um, that's a good thing. So some of our people like uh, Astrid has done it in the virtual world. Um, I have my application all set. I'm waiting for live. I wanna be on a live stage to do mine. And, so I think I need to do one just because I'm advising people to do them. <laughs> okay, yeah, credibility. Um, also, now we weren't working at the time, but I've done this for other authors. And if you want to have a quick call with me before, if you have some event and you have your outline and you want to punch it up with a little humor, I'm a gag writer. I'll do that as a gift to you. And I've done it for some of our authors. And uh, we have one who, uh, um, I don't think I'm talking out of school on this one. He's a former special agent of the FBI. Um, he's actually a funny man, but you don't know it uh, because that's not how he talks. And, uh, but it's also perfect because he's so serious going this way. I've given him some zingers he's thrown in at, at talks like to the NFL that just will bring the house down. So. I'm happy to offer that. Okay, so we, we've had some other questions here, but I have one. I know you're a generous man, Jeff Foley. Do you have any free gifts to offer the people on the call? Yeah, uh, yeah, thank you. I, uh, I've written two books. Uh, these are the two that I, I showed you earlier. They are both on my uh, website, both available on Amazon and all the other ways to do that. But I have a free chapter from each book that you can go to my website uh, and go to the books and, and download the free chapter. It's all there. Uh, it's for everyone. Uh, they're the, I think they're the fun chapters uh, and that they might be valuable and useful to you. Thanks. Now we had a question and I'm going to, I think, paraphrase the question. I hope I'm getting it right. But um, so there's the world of the U.S. Army. And I know in working with you and things with Ken Blanchard, and there's actually this part of the army people don't see about servant leadership. And it's, it's not all that command and control. You've mentioned that, that you think it is if you haven't been there. Mm -hmm. But let's go into the business world. And how do you make that bridge for people who are a little resistant? Like, oh, you know, that sounds a little too rigid and uh, the Prussian army or whatever they're thinking about this where you can bring a valuable message to people today and, and with workers who are Gen X and millennials and uh, whatever the next group is, that's not necessarily in a military mindset. Actually, the, the, my, one of my initial coaching engagements in cons turned into be just, not just coaching one-on-one, -on -one, but consulting for the entire organization is Williams Company. Uh, and the CEO of the company read my Sunday articles in the paper. He read several of them over time. And he goes, Jeff, I know you're an army guy, but I, I really like what you wrote. Everything that you wrote and your experience in the army and what you put on paper and had published in the local Augusta Chronicle newspaper resonated with me. And I would like to have a conversation with you more about that. Uh, this is the CEO of Williams Company. Uh, there's, I think they had 450 people in that company uh, today. They've grown dramatically over the time. And, but even the CEO was a, was a pretty senior guy. He said, going back to that army thing is, I think you can bring some value and some real coaching and experience to my team. And I think they need what you got, but convince me that it's not just going to be the army approach because we don't go to boot camp and 
Not everybody does everything we tell them to do all the time, and we have a different set of issues. And so my point was, I got to start with the leader, the president of the company and the leadership team. And over the course of time, we can build a model. And I really used most of my stuff in here. But really, the brave model is fundamentals of timeless leadership. Whether you wear the uniform or not is immaterial. You know, this character thing and this the investment in the development of leaders, anybody who assumes and promotes people into leadership, into leadership positions and just assumes they got everything they need to be successful is setting them up to fail. We don't do that in the Army. And that was my message to them. If you're going to promote guys and gals into become store managers, you have to equip them. You have to train them. You have to develop them. You have to cultivate this ability to be credible or competent. And you want them to be committed to the exercise before you put them in a very high risk job where you're going to have high expectations. And so when we have that dialogue and they see that I'm serious about this, and I use the example of how the army invests, then they can see how they must invest, not just in me, but in their people and into programs that can help their leaders develop their own team. It is a conversation and an engaging one, but it really is, you know, the servant leadership model exists in the United States Army. Most people don't believe that. Uh, the word sergeant in the United States Army actually means it comes from the French word servient. It is servant. Sergeant equals servant. How can I serve you? What is it in the Army? How can higher, head, higher headquarters exist to support the lower uh, headquarters? We have no succession strategy in the United States Army. We don't have it separate. Every leader is evaluated on his or her ability to develop those direct reports to them. We all know we're going to be promoted and move out. We have to develop everybody. It is an evaluation. It is a competency that everybody in the Army and in the military must have to develop our people and help them grow and get promoted. That's not necessarily true in the commercial world, in the business world. But the point is, when I share that kind of stuff with them, they see that I got something to offer and they see that I can have an impact. And then we go from there. That helpful? A oh, very helpful. A, a follow-up question. It's, it's from Bill Leiter and he was talking about General McChrystal who talks a lot about creating flat organizations. You mentioned this in a couple of different answers, but I thought I'd ask the question. Um, with this idea of control being driven down to the lowest levels, the the non-com, the non-commissioned officers, the sergeants, the corporals. Um, so how do you advise people on dealing with that and moving forward when you're working with them? Yeah, that's another great question. I'll tell you, Stan McChrystal is a great friend of mine. I, he's a marvelous leader and, and he's doing great things for the business commercial world today. Uh, but I, it, it goes back to, I mean, he spent a lot of his time in the special operations world where they decentralized as much as possible and put special operations teams commanded by captains with 11 or 12 person teams all through Iraq and Afghanistan and, and all of that and empowered them to do what they needed to do. This goes back to the education and training. We educate soldiers at every level to think, and we train soldiers to act. And when you put those two together, it can be effective delegation to the lowest level possible. And when you can do that, and you can delegate and give uh, the junior people the authority to make decisions that is commensurate with the responsibility that you have given them, you can get rid of some of the corporate hierarchy. You won't need as many people at the higher echelons. But you got to do that. If you withhold decision authority to make every decision at the highest level, you'll never get away from that. The Army can't be successful. And it's one of the reasons why the United States Army is so revered by just about every other Army in the world, because we invest so much in that. But you have to attack it. You have to do it. Yeah. 
Jeff, final question. Yeah. Is there something that you want to promote or something that in your work you're trying to get the message out there that you could share with uh, this group because the Indie Books family is about helping each other and about amplifying a message. So I put it to you. Well, I have found that the most significant, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> The most significant challenge or problem I help leaders solve is their leadership ineffectiveness. That is what I do. I, and that is really defined in the three most significant challenges that have been brought to my attention and through my entire coaching experience. The one is big egos. Leaders forget how to listen. The second is Leaders, we have a, an accountability crisis in our country today. Leaders do not know how to hold people accountable. And the third piece of this leadership ineffectiveness that I come across regularly is this inability to effectively delegate, which means how do you delegate? You have to diagnose an individual's competence and commitment to perform a task before you can effectively delegate a task or an objective for them to solve. Those are the three biggest challenges that I help address. And so as you think about your books and the challenges, what problem are you trying to solve? And if you don't know the problem you're trying to solve, it will be very difficult for you to be able to connect, connect with any client, any potential client, and help offer tools that might help them address the challenge. That's great, Jeff. So if we bump into somebody and they're talking about leadership effectiveness, you know, and they're looking for somebody to help solve that problem, now you can all say, <laughs> I know a guy. I know a guy. That guy is General Jeff Foley. Thank you so much, Jeff, for being with us today. Um, it's, it's an honor to have you in the family. So thanks, everybody, for your attention today. Uh, we do these every week, love to have you and love to have the roll call. Also, if you would like to be a speaker, please contact me and see what the message is. Jeff's today was how to get people to read your book. Pretty important. Thank you so much. So with that, we'll see you next week. Thanks everybody. Have a great week.